Good morning. Uh, my name is Catherine T. Brock. I'm the Chief Deputy General Counsel uh, for Policy at CDCR. Um, my purpose here this morning is to give you a brief overview of the court's orders and sort of the procedural history of um, these issues uh, underlying the, uh, uh, the budget request. Um, and then certainly to the extent there are questions um, that are that go to the heart of the court's orders, I'm happy to uh, talk about that as well. But first, just in terms of the procedural history, plaintiff's counsel in this case uh, brought a series of motions in May of 2013 related to the housing and treatment of class members in segregated environments and uh, on the use of force and disciplinary measures against members of the plaintiff's class. That resulted in hearings, evidentiary hearings, between October and early December 2013, uh, and an order issued April 10th, 2014. Um, after those orders issued, uh, you may or may not know that the orders uh, required the defendants to work under the guidance of the special master uh, to develop um, and implement uh, policies and procedures to address the violations that the court found. Um, those negotiations occurred over the course of several months um, and resulted in a series of filings in August of 2014. Uh, the first of which was in on August 4th, I'm sorry, August 1st, um, later uh, approved by the court on August 11th. That first order uh, addressed the use of force policy, uh, management cell status, non-disciplinary policies, EOP, I'm sorry, the Enhanced Outpatient um, Program for the um, ASU hub, hub certification, uh, as well as the unclothed body search policy. Um, later in August, uh, we filed a plan um, related to the administrative segregation um, and the uh, security housing unit for the, the uh, triple CMS population through the creation of the short-term and long-term restricted housing um, units, as well as a case-by-case -case review policy. Um, uh, the court approved that order the same day on uh, August 29. Uh, notably, the, um, the policies uh, were not, were filed with concurrence of the special master and uh, there were no objections filed by plaintiff's counsel um, on those submissions. If you'd like, I can, we, well, we're set to talk through each of those issues. Do you have any questions on the procedural history that I should be touching on? On the procedural history, just sort of how we, the order of the, no. okay. No, not unless members of the committee do. No. So we can probably um, go through each of those um, issues then first. Uh, probably go through the use of force. Does that work? You want to? Certainly. Uh, again, my name is Kathleen Allison. I'm the Deputy Director of Facility Support for CDCR. And the use of force, the key element changes of, we had two different types of changes in our use of force policy um, over the last year. Initially, we changed our controlled use of force policy which the, the key elements of that controlled use of force policy was to have a clinical intervention at the time of a controlled use of force, prior to the controlled use of force. Um, and then the, the other substantive change was to identify specific amounts and frequency of chemical agents. So those were the primary uh, changes the use of force policy. We subsequently went to a change to our general use of force policy, which is for immediate um, force. So an incident is occurring on a particular yard, and so it provides the, the, the training, provided the staff with more of a critical thinking element to really go through um, evaluating the totality of the situation, to try and include um, the inmate's demeanor, looking at his bizarre behavior, if they're aware of his mental health status, medical status, and his ability to understand orders. So those were key elements that hadn't been taught before to really make them to pause and think and to select the best use of force option 
um, it gives them an opportunity um, through scenario-based training to learn some of these things. Um, we also really focused on um, verbal persuasion and effective communication to de-escalate a situation prior to the use of force. Um, the management cell status component um, was really the key element with that was to have a clinical intervention. Anytime an inmate is acting out, um, oftentimes it's bizarre behavior, to really get a clinical input into why that's happening, um, to see if there's a mental health reason versus just a behavioral reason. So those were the key, key elements to, to those two uh, pieces. Our short-term, uh, oh, certainly, the, the, the resources needed, Angela will speak to that. And again, I'm Angela Ponciano, CDCR Associate Director of the Statewide Mental Health Program. In regards to the use of force in management sales status policy changes um, and the budget request requires additional clinicians as clinicians are now required to be there for every controlled use of force situation, um, and that, that was 24 hours a day, um, both during the incident as well as after, uh, consultation with custody staff, nursing staff, uh, discussing the mental health status of the inmate de-escalation techniques. Um, and also mental health clinicians with the new policy are also required to uh, serve on the Institution Executive Review Committee to review all controlled and immediate use of force incidents with any mental health inmate. As for the management cell status policy change, mental health clinicians um, are now required to uh, meet with the inmate on an emergent basis if they're in the mental health system and are on management cell status, and every 24 hours thereafter until they're removed from that status, develop behavior plans to work with the inmate um, on what caused them to be on management cell status to help them get off of that, consult with custody, um, discuss what is on that plan to work together with the inmate um, and uh, get them off that status. So those are the changes for mental health with those policies. Okay, could you just briefly say how many hours of training are you giving people? In regards to these specific items here? Yeah, the mental health training. You said additional hours of training and training on use of force and use of pepper spray and other chemical agents, right? So I'm, I'm, it's broken down separately. Um, the correctional officer's staff receive an additional three hours of training. There was a four hour component uh, for clinical staff. Uh, for the clinical training as it relates to use of force. That's new training for the four hours or uh, that's what has always been there? That is new training. And when you say uh, the mental health clinician, is that who you're talking about? Yes. Okay, are those, um, can you tell me what kind of education is required for that position? I'm sorry, it's a, are we talking about what's commonly referred to as psych techs, or are we talking about psychiatrists? This would be psychologists, Who are they? Um, clinical social workers, and psychiatrists. Okay, and that is so that they will know what to do when they're consulted by the custody staff? Who gets this? What the, the initial training was to go over the new policy, the new use of force policy. And in addition to that, um, in the mental health specialized training unit, we have developed um, interview <coughs> technique training to assist with that. So motivational interviewing techniques. Um, in regards to the management cell status policy change, we've developed some new behavioral plan training for the clinicians to help guide them in developing these behavioral plans for the um, inmates on management cell status. Okay. Um, now, the, mo the motivational interviewing and that sort of thing, is that part of the three hours that no, you referred to? Or that's in addition to that's the three hours? That's in addition hours? to. Okay. Can you actually uh, let us have uh, an outline of what the training is? 
like we get from C Post and that kind of thing? Because um, three hours isn't, I mean, so what are they getting as part of their job and what is the additional training as a result of this special master's report? Um, so it's basically mental health clinicians and custodial staff each get some additional training. As well as nursing staff. And the nursing staff, do they get the four hours or the three hours? The initial training was four hours for, um, on the, and we have to separate it out for controlled use of force versus immediate use of force. So mm -hmm. nursing, mental health clinicians, and, and custody managers receive the initial four hours. The three hours of training is for the rank and file correctional officers. Okay. And we can provide both those lesson okay. plans. And is this one time or ongoing? Um, the initial use of force policy for immediate was one time. The, the three hour component is ongoing. Okay. Meaning, meaning what? All new staff will get it? They'll all new staff and all staff annually. Okay, so that will be annually. And when you say we developed, um, how, who developed the training and um, who delivers the training? Well, we put together a collaboration team of both um, custody managers as well as mental health um, leadership and, and, nurse, nursing and nursing leadership as well. They put mm -hmm. together the training and they trained it together on the immediate use of force training. Excuse me, I correct on the, control. on the controlled use of force. Uh, on the immediate use of force, it was it was primarily custodial uh, staff managers that put that training together with the cooperation of our GALT uh, training um, academy. And we should note as well that the uh, training modules were discussed at length with the special master expert team. Um, so they uh, weighed in and provided some uh, guidance on how to modify and improve that proposed training. And, and what's mm -hmm. different with this training, unlike other trainings that we've had, is we brought, each institution was to designate staff to be certified trainers. And only those certified trainers can provide this training at the institution. And we really feel like that's a key element. We've handpicked those staff to provide that training. And in addition, our, our our main training team who provided it to all of the managers and provided it to all of the certified trainers, they will go out and do kind of on-site inspection to make sure that the message is, is staying consistent, <coughs> that the message from what headquarters expects gets all the way down to every institution throughout the state. Okay. Um, could you also talk a little bit more about the infrastructure constraints that were alluded to that de um, prevent the department from providing additional out-of-cell time to women and in people in reception centers that are CCCMS? Certainly. Or in segregated housing. <laughs> Certainly. Um, the court order, the subsequent court orders and agreement that were established with the uh, special master and, and plaintiffs, we had to, currently our enhanced outpatient program inmates that are in segregated housing receive 20 hours of total out of cell time in a given week. Our mental health, our lower level of mental health inmates, which is our clinical uh, case management inmates, commonly known as triple CMS, uh, those currently only received 10 hours of out of cell time for exercise yard, and then they would receive their whatever their hourly clinical contact was for that given week. Through this process, we determined that they ha we had to change the conditions of confinement for segregated housing. So segregated housing being administrative segregation for, for this purpose, uh, we had to change um, to 20, it was a total of 20 hours of out of cell time to include 18 and a half hours of out of cell time for um, male offenders 
at these very specific institutions. And the reason why those institutions were selected is they had the physical plant design. These were our, what we call our standalone administrative segregation units that historically could not house mental health inmates in them. They are designed with treatment space built into the building. Um, unlike our other designs that are kind of wide open, these are very sectioned off. Um, sections where I, I, I don't know the exact number of sections within the building, but they have treatment space built in for both group and individual treatment, as well as they have individual exercise yards. Each of them was built with 20 exercise yards to accommodate the population of maximum capacity being 200. Um, our existing ASU units that house mental health did not have that same physical plant designed to accommodate the 20 hours of out of cell. We have less, that they range anywhere, and I don't have the exact number, but um, they did not have the 20 ex individual exercise yards that the um, standalones did. So the, the 15 hours that's different for the um, reception center inmates as well as the females, as well as the long-term segregated housing units, which are our um, security housing units at Corcoran. They did not have the, the space available to accommodate 20 hours either. So, and it really is totally about physical plant and the ability to provide that time. So for reception center inmates and for female inmates, it was not um, additional out of cell as far as yard, but it was determined additional out of cell in what we call a, a um, what are we calling it, Adam chair now? The secure, it, it, it's basically, it's a secure chair that um, we were able to place on the day room floors for them to have socialization, television in case they didn't have television available to them in, the, in their cells. Um, it's, it's important. Could you explain what a secure chair is? I'm sorry. I okay, historically we provided any kind of out of cell and what we call a therapeutic treatment module, mm -hmm. but it's basically a very large holding cell with a seat. So the therapeutic chairs is a, is a chair that it almost looks like an old fashioned school desk, but they are able to secure within that desk. It's got a, a very large uh, table top to where they could do work. Um, it's, it's a comfortable seat as far as seating. Are you uh, to it? Yes, you are secured to the chair, yes. So you're sitting there in a chair? You're secured at your feet and you have um, extended waist restraints to where you could have freedom of movement to be able to write or engage in, in activity with um, the clinician. If you okay. I think it's important to note here also that um, certainly we've talked at length with both plaintiff's counsel and uh, the special master team about not only the chairs, but the environment and the out of cell time in those um, separate locations for the, for the women and the reception center. Those, all of those uh, negotiations and conversations were, uh, had very specifically uh, negotiated, agreed upon, and ultimately expressly ordered by the court. I am. So do all of the CCCMS units have administrative segregation components? The, no. R currently, we, there are 10 standalone units that have been identified to house these, similar to what we have now for our enhanced outpatient program hubs. We have designated institutions. We will have designated institutions to house the triple C triple CMS inmates at these 10 standalones at nine institutions. So one institution has two of them. We were not able to utilize the facilities in our desert institutions. Um, for what reason? The desert institutions are prohibited uh, pursuant to the Corman Coleman court order due to the heat in the, in the desert and the problems with psychotropic meds and heat. Okay. Um, 
I guess I'm, I'm interested in the budget proposal, which has almost 300 new positions over the two-year period. Um, it seems like many of the things that you need to do are either infrastructure changes or training and attitude changes. Why do you need so many more people? Um, uh, some of the changes require additional staffing. We talked a little bit about the use of force changes and a clinician is now required to be um, at every controlled use of force instance. Also have more involvement in the management cell status portion. In regards to the short-term restricted housing and the long-term restricted housing, we've increased the amount of uh, therapy being provided to the inmates as well as um, the clinical contacts. Also, um, there's some staffing for nursing because in, currently in our um, shoes, they, they do weekly contacts. It's going to be increased, increased to daily in the long-term restricted. That's for mentally ill people in solitary confinement? That's for the, mm -hmm. um, the triple CMS mm -hmm. um, inmates that are currently in the SHU okay. will now be in the long-term restricted housing units, and their conditions of confinement have also changed with increased contacts, um, increased out-of-cell time, and increased therapy. Right. Um, and so for the use of force management cell status, um, the short-term restricted housing and long-term restricted housing, those are the main components of the increased staffing uh, for the clinical side. Um, I think some of the other staffing is in related to the increase of the inmate patient welfare check system, the Guard One system currently in place. Correct. We haven't quite got there. Um, the middle, we... On the custody side, there were minimal, minimal resources needed. There was an offset um, of our existing A issue, or existing administrative segregation, excuse me, I'll try not to use acronyms mm -hmm. up here. Um, we were able to offset that. So the total net need was about 17.6 positions to activate the 10 um, long, or the 10 short-term restricted housings as well as the long-term restricted housing. And that's to accommodate the obviously the additional 10 hours a week of at a cell time. Right. So approximately how many of these new positions, because there are going to be 290.4 permanent positions um, in the end. Um, and so Joyce Tejo, receiver's office. So um, just to make it clear in terms of our portion of this BCP, we need 70 positions for psych techs, and that is in the restricted housing program. We will be going from weekly checks to daily checks. And so that's the part of uh, this BCP that um, comes from us. Mm -hmm. And when you say daily checks, what does that actually include? So the psychiatric technician will be responsible for checking on a daily basis in terms of the inmates' welfare that is in the mental health program in the restricted housing setting. So what we do right now in terms of weekly, under the court order, we're going to be required to do that on a daily basis. And it's another set of eyes and ears in the program to make sure that the restricted housing um, program and the services provided are being provided on a daily basis. Is this a conversation um, through a cell door, in person? What is it? Um, is it a check, are you okay, goodbye? <laughs> no, it, no, it's, it's more it, than that, what, you know, obviously. And I think, entail? I believe it is cell front. So, um, and we do it, um, you know, within the program um, on a regular basis. Yeah. So what did you say, it's inside the it, cell? No, no, it's cell front. Okay, so, so you're talking basically correct. through the door. Correct. Okay. Which is a little window, right? If I remember what I've seen for different administrative everywhere. segregation. Uh, for the most part, yes. Different everywhere. Yeah, but the one's so H1's different. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hayhoe. Um, okay, are there other questions from members of the committee? Um, I just okay. looked at this and I wondered why, the, in terms of changing um, some of the procedures. Uh, that can't be done without asking for more money. That's kind of the, yeah. we're the budget committee. So I'm looking at, uh, 
you know, like training, um, you have the C-post training requirements, right? You, you adjust that often. That comes up and you occasionally will adjust the training modules and so forth. And it seems like um, in terms of mental health, especially mental health training, um, pepper spray or whatever probably should have been done already is probably some kind of training. Uh, isn't that something you can just simply adjust the, the total, you know, the training modules and deal with the training issue that way in terms of that? And then your, your ongoing training requirements, so uh, you do ongoing, ongoing training. Isn't that simply just adjusting the, the training module uh, procedures? And why, you know, that's, that's a question. So I'm looking at the budget. I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, sir, why, why Yeah, it's sort to... of like what I asked before. If you're yeah, training. Yeah. You're training them already. The you're... Yeah. And obviously, we didn't train them in the use of pepper spray adequately yeah, yeah, that's because there's problems. That's right. So why is it, why does it take so much ongoing money when you could, we could just presumably get a better training program? So Clint Kelton, Department of Finance, if I, <clears throat> if I may, on the training component here, I think you're kind of talking, I believe, about the Correction Officer Academy and there is a process for curriculum development. The resources requested here related to training are going to participate in that process to the extent there's, you know, um, cross-discipline need, but they're also developing, reviewing, updating, and improving the training for the mental health clinicians and the nurses that are interacting with inmates with mental illness. So that's a focus team that doesn't exist today. Um, and there's a lot of talk about training, and training is a part of it because we're asking for a lot of resources because we want them to become effective, but there's a lot of new workload here. So when the department was talking about, you know, having a clinician on and available for controlled use of force events, that's additional new workload. You're going to have clinicians that are involved involved in the management cell status and developing behavior plans. That's new work. <laughs> You're having more clinical interactions in these short-term and long-term restricted housing units that didn't exist prior to that. That's new workload. They have additional out-of-cell time. You have to have additional custody staff available to make sure that cell time um, is available to them. That's new workload. Um, and then the, we haven't gone all the way through the various components, but there's the, the welfare checks. These are uh, welfare checks and condemned and the security housing units, the longer term stay solitary confinement <coughs> units. And those didn't exist previously. They are kind of a uh, and I have best practice in suicide prevention in those units. They have a unit to kind of make sure there's accountability of staff. Again, new workload that the department wasn't doing previously, and so there's additional staff required yeah, I understand for that. that so it's just, it, yeah. there's, there's, it takes bodies to do the new work. Training is part of it, and that's why we've asked for some dedicated resources to that, and as they go through this process, kind of improving who, the, for everybody, but there's also new workload in this proposal that's been court ordered and agreed upon. Um, that, you know, that's driving the need for additional positions and additional dollars. I think perhaps what would be helpful to the committee would be knowing which of the new resources are exactly that, additional clinical positions because there's going to be more out of cell time and therefore you need somebody to help program that, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed, you know, we don't really have that kind of breakdown. So it does raise the question about training existing people. And not only that, but I think one of the things that came out of the really dreadful situation at Stockton with the pepper spray was there wasn't cross-training between custody and clinical staff, and nobody knew who was in charge, and it defaulted to people without adequate uh, use of force training, well, let me put it that way. So, yeah, so, can, can How, I, you know, let, if we could, let me, I'd like to yes. try and respond to that. Um, part of our initial controlled use of force was to address that collaboration issue and to develop a mechanism if there was disagreement with clinician and custody at the site of an incident, that there was a mechanism to raise it to a higher level to uh, up to the warden and up to the chief of mental health. So that initial training has already occurred. That was a collaboration training. Our, and then our initial training on our immediate use of force is being done 
now and then it will be subsequently on an ongoing basis in their regular 40 hour annual training requirement. So it will be folded into there ultimately. We, due to the pressures of the court order, we had to get out the initial block of training, you know, obviously as soon as possible. Um, and that training is occurring as we speak today. Okay, thank you. And I'm interested in the, the there's been the implication here that there's gonna be more out of cell time and therefore maybe better programming, improved programming, more programming. I, I don't know what words to use, um, and that's why we need more clinicians and more custodial staff. Um, I, can you give us more detail on what the additional or improved programming will look like, and who's developing it? And okay, I'll talk kind of about the custodial piece for the custodial piece for the short-term restricted housing, which is at our what we call our standalones they will have an additional eight and a half hours of recreational yard. Um, we also installed um, pull-up bars and some additional recreation equipment within those yards that those small, the individual exercise yards did not have previously. These units also, and I neglected to mention earlier that these units were selected because they all had power and they all had cable capability within the cell where our existing um, segregated units did not have that, the, the power uh, within the cell. They were not built with the, with the power. And so, you know, to prevent um, from sensory deprivation from being within the cell for long periods of time, the television or electrical appliance radio was determined to be the best option um, for people with, with mental illness. Um, I thought everybody had a, either a TV or a radio if they were in solitary confinement. If there's power available, if not, we have um, purchased um, what we call a hand crank radio that um, provides some. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, you know, See, it's. Well, yeah, the statement's been Sam. made that it wasn't really solitary confinement because everybody had a TV. But I not, not all units have, if, if they have power available, then yes, they have a television available to them, but not all of the units have power. So then in those units that do not have power, we purchased what we call a hand crank radio uh, that is issued out to an inmate. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough, so we have to rotate them uh, through on so a is, is loan basis. So having like, for instance, a radio for everybody um, in a segregated unit, part of the budget here? It's part of the, yes, it's part of the short-term restricted housing units to uh, additional radios to be purchased, electric radios for those units okay. since they in fact do have power. We will take the other hand crank radios and disseminate them out to those units without power. So everybody will have one? I'm not sure if everybody will have one at the ones with no power. That's something we'll have. Everybody in the mental health units will have one, yes. But the ex other administrative segregation units, I'm not sure, due to the breakage of the, radi the hand crank radios, if there will be enough for every single offender. Okay, well, I think that's the kind of thing that um, the committee would be interested in. Okay. Um, pretty interested. I didn't realize. I thought every single person had a television. Um, because of sensory deprivation, but if there, if that's not the case, would it come under? See, these are all positions and costs. So, under the um, five point six million dollars for short and long-term housing unit improvement, it's on page twenty-two of our analysis. I, I'm just curious. Does that mean that everybody? We're going to have boots on the ground here, and in the sense that everybody's going to have a better chance at retaining mental health or not decomposing in the situation. And that seems like a relatively small capital cost. So, we, again, um, and we have a work group, or workbooks that are. Um, have been created for segregated inmates to help keep them busy. We have the radio program um, with the additional group hours we're doing 
self-help groups, anger management groups, so they get additional um, group therapy, and we can provide you with um, a listing of the, of, the, of the therapies that will be provided in these units as well. I think that would be terrific, because one of the problems is we can neither make policy through the bill process or make budget decisions unless, unless we have uh, some understanding of what it uh, really looks like, <laughs> right? We do have costs in here for additional radios and earbuds within, within the budget change proposal. Okay. Yeah. So we will, um, we will be looking at all of that, and my recommendation is that we hold this item open because uh, so that we can look at the con look at it in context with some of the other requests. Yes. So before we move on, is there any public comment on this item? Okay. Seeing. Oh, there is. Hi, my name is Adrienne Roberts. I'm with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, along with a few other people who are here. Um, what we know from our members, who we meet with regularly inside the two women's prisons, and also some re reports from the CDCR, is that there's, and what we've seen over years, a major discrepancy between um, what's being described as additional training and what it actually looks like inside the prisons. And we've been through multiple moments of additional trainings in the past throughout the Coleman lawsuit. Um, we know that welfare checks often mean an, an officer walking past a, a cell and not really doing anything and counting that as a welfare check. We know that therapists uh, have very brief sessions very rarely with people who are experiencing mental health uh, difficulties. And we also know that um, well, one of the things that we're, we're advocating for majorly is to transfer all people with any mental health issues from the SHU because it's not a therapeutic environment. No rehabilitation is gonna make it a therapeutic environment. Um, we have a member who died, um, who was housed in the SHU two years ago who had been asking continuously for medical help and wasn't receiving any help at all because the welfare checks weren't happening. Um, we also know that custodial staff is a major barrier to accessing mental health. Um, and that perhaps additional trainings, some might believe, would help that. But at the end of the day, custodial staff, their role is very different than a mental health physician. And we recent, one of the people who we know who recently committed suicide at CIW had asked for help from mental health staff, first having to go through custodial staff the very same day that she killed herself. Um, so in addition to asking for uh, outside independent investigation into the CIW specifically in all women's prisons, we advocate for transferring all people who are experiencing mental health difficulties out of the shoe altogether. Thanks. Thank you. 